Well, good morning, Emmanuel family. I want to welcome you to worship with us this morning, and I want to ask you to stand with me as we prepare our hearts to worship. Our call to worship uh, this morning comes, well, actually, I forgot to write it down. I believe from Philippians, and you all uh, have a part to speak as well from the Psalms, and so I just want to invite us and have God's word invite us and call us into worship this morning. Come to the Lord and bring a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in Christ Jesus. For a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. So come. Sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love, Jesus. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of sin's old sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the palace clean, his blood avail for me. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud, there is one. There is one great love, Jesus. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful, broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud, there is one. There is one great Jesus, Jesus. All right, as we sing and come into worship this morning, I've told you before and we've said before that worship is about hearing the people around you. Uh, when we come together, I want you to hear the people behind you and beside you. This morning, we're about to sing, there are so few words that never grow old, like Jesus. What I'd like to ask you all to do is, would you just call out for the people around you, call out for, for the people around you what Jesus has been for you. Make sure we can hear. I want to hear. Has he been your redeemer? Has he been your sustainer? Has he been your portion, your healer? Would you just call out? Let's hear what Jesus has been to us. Any more? I hear Savior. I hear Comforter. 
a rest. That's good. That's good. I can't hear everybody up here, but I hope you can hear the people around you. Jesus is sweet. He is our comforter. He is our rest. He is our peace. Sing with me. There are so few words that never grow old. There are so few words that never grow old. Jesus. 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 So come on. There is one great love. So come on and sing out. Let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love. There is one great love. There is one great love. Jesus. I had to wait on the head nod. He told me I'm going to do something different. I don't want you to come up. So I was waiting for I got my signal. You can be seated, church family. Hey, we're glad that you're here. If you're online with us right now or here in, in our building here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, we're excited to worship with you this morning. We're excited that you're here, and we're excited that it's a little bit cooler this morning, right? That's right. It's been a great day already. If you were a part of our grow groups, of our small groups or Sunday school this morning, we're glad. If you don't have a small group, if you don't have a grow group that you're a part of, we would love to invite you. Even if you don't know where you're going to fit yet, we'll help you find one. We have them stretched out from every age, every walk of life, every place, and we want to get you to be a part of that. If you'll come um, next week, we're actually going to promote next Sunday. All of our classes promote um, into into new grades. I know if you're in the older classes or other classes, we'll just say other classes, not older ones. That sounded bad. The other classes, you don't always move classes, but our grades and things like that with school coming up and with our vacation Bible school this week, we're promoting and moving into classes and even moving some classrooms down in our basement area, our children's area, moving some classrooms around because of the new schools going in and the new construction with the bathrooms in the basement. We finally, we waited until now to put this off so we can kick this off. And so if your kids are not a part of those, we want to invite you 930 every Sunday morning. We have our grow groups and adults. We have ones for you as well. Some of the upcoming things this week that we want you to be aware of tonight at six o'clock in our front parking lot, we are going to have some wet and uh, wild games and inflatables. We'll have some hot dogs and some snacks, and we're going to be out there from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock also registering for Vacation Bible School, okay? So here in a second, when I have everybody stand and greet, I'm going to stand up here. If you need a card, now this is a card you can invite a friend, family member, neighbor, kid that crosses through your grass that you've told eight times not to do that. You can still invite them to Vacation Bible School. Our Vacation Bible School is for those that are going into first through sixth grade. Going into, we're already going to promote them. Hey, it's August as of tomorrow. We might as well already talk about school, and the groan comes from the youth group. Okay, cool. So, it is school time. So, tonight, we're going to register. So, if you have a friend or somebody you want to invite, this is a great way. Leave it on their door or actually talk to them, whichever there's a QR code. When they come up, they're going to scan that with their phone. All the registration's done on their phone really quick. Okay. After that, we're going to register them, and then they're free to have a hot dog and go inflatables. There's an obstacle course. There's a slip and slide, but it's inflatable, so you're not going to, like, belly flop on the concrete. Okay. And that'll be out front. So, hope, come. And even if you're not, even if you have nobody at VBS, you've done church family, come and have a fellowship and enjoy watching kids here at our church have a blast and laugh and get wet. And you become, bring your lawn chair, sit out underneath the awning. Should be a cooler night than it's been. So, hey, if you're going to do that at home, come do it out here. 
So that's going on. Um, also on the 10th of August, which is a week from this Wednesday, we're going to be packing backpacks to give away on the 14th. Okay, we're doing our back to school block party on the 14th. We're going to be giving away 300 backpacks. Okay, um, we have we had a need of 6,000 pencils. That need has been met. We have already got 6,000 pencils donated. We have 600 erasers that were donated. Okay, we have had money given to buy 300 pencil sharpeners given. So we have to pack all of that into 300 backpacks along with a card about our fall activities here at the church in backpacks on the 10th at 6 o'clock. You can come be a part, and then we're going to give those away on the 14th, okay? Everybody's invited. Everybody in the community is invited to our block party. It's from 6 to 7, and we will give backpacks away at 645, okay? There will be a short registration only so we can account, but also so we can tell people this fall, all these families, about our fall activities coming up, okay? So that's going on, block party, two other things going on, because also not only high school and elementary schools are kicking back up, but so is college. And so we have some college ministry events going on. Every year we do a progressive dinner um, in support with the BCM on campus, and that is on the 20th. And we are salads and appetizers. If you haven't been a part of this, here's what happens. All these new freshmen come, they meet at the BCM, they load them into vehicles, and they bring them here first all of them, and we have appetizers. We get to tell them about our church. They're here for about 20 minutes. They eat. We get to know them. We introduce ourselves, and then they go to one of the other Baptist churches in town. They have an entree. They have the main course, and then they go to another Baptist church in town, and they have dessert, okay? We are stop number one. Well, we need to show a good spread here. Come on. We need some appetizers, salad. It used to say salads, but let's just go with appetizers, horse divorce, hors d'oeuvres, whatever, however you want to say that. But we need those. and You can sign up for those on the big bulletin board down by the welcome desk. And uh, that's on the 20th. And then one other thing is we will do be doing noonday at the BCM. Every Wednesday, the BCM supplies lunch for, the college, for college students that want to come. They serve usually in the fall about 140 kids every Wednesday. Okay? Well, one, one Wednesday of that semester, we provide the food. So that is on August 24th, that Wednesday, and we need desserts, okay? So the easiest way is um, prepackaged um, Little Debbie-type desserts, and they actually have a ping-pong table. And here's, my, here, here's, here's Craig's thing, okay? So we want to fill a ping-pong table full of Hostess desserts, prepackaged Little Debbie-type stuff, okay? And we just open the boxes and dump them out. The best part about that is when we have to clean everything up, we just leave. Because I don't know about how many college students have no problem going and being like, I'm going to class. I want like four of these. Take them. We're not bringing them back here. So lots and lots of little Debbies. There's a basket outside on the corner right above the steps. You can bring your little Debbies and dump them in there. There's no amount we're trying to get to. Just imagine a lot. Okay? A lot. So that's what's upcoming. It's school. There's a lot of announcements, a lot of things. Our church does a lot of things in August, and sorry you have to sit through it, but we want you to be involved. These are not just, hey, these are fun things. No, be a part, be active, be a blessing. Bless the world as Emmanuel Baptist Church. Hey, we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. Why don't you stand with us? Greet those around you. We're excited. If you need a card for registration for Vacation Bible School, come grab one.
right, I want to invite you to make your way back to your seat as we continue to sing together. We lift up the name of Jesus. The great good news that Jesus uh, has for us this morning. And would you sing along with us as we celebrate the good news of the gospel. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. And hallelujah. Praise the one set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is a big Salvation. 
mission in your name, Jesus Christ, my Savior. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Amen. Amen. What a thing to sing. Death had had a grip on me. It had a grip on each of us. But if you're in Christ, death no longer has its grip on you. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Riches I not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. prayer of your people, Lord Jesus, the prayer of our heart. It's in Christ's name.
Y'all can be seated, and I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward as we uh, prepare to take the offering. Father, just ask a very special blessing on each and every one here. Father, as we come to a time in the service where we give back a portion of what you've allowed us to have, I pray that you bless the gift as well as the giver. Father, I pray that uh, we take these funds and we use them to strengthen your church and to further your kingdom. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. And as we continue to worship, I told you a few weeks ago that I wanted to start to introduce some songs that come out of the Psalms for us. So we have a new one to learn this morning, so I'm going to sing it for you while we, while we are seated, and it comes from Psalm 8. And so here's, uh, here's what God's Word says in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 9. It says, When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. start to set in motion, O oh God. I sing all glory and honor. What is man that you are mindful, the Son of Man, that you would care for him. We sing all glory and honor, O oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome my always majestic is your name in all the earth oh lord our lord may we see your kingdom come father may your will be done in all the earth in all the earth you gave dominion to your children and you crowned them oh god with glory and honor, so we'll sing of your name, live our lives for your greatness, O oh God. And your glory and honor, O oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways, how majestic is your name in all the earth, O oh Lord. Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. The earth is full of the glory of God. Come make much of the name above all names. Creation cries out and every knee bows. Jesus, we crown you, O Lord, our Lord. The earth is full of the glory of God. Come make much of the name above all names. Creation cries out and every knee bows. Jesus, we How awesome are your ways, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come, Father, may your will be done. 
Will you sing that with us? Oh, Lord, our Lord. Oh, Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord. May we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. Oh, we sing one more time. Oh, Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth, in all the earth. Amen. Lord Jesus, that is our cry and our prayer. Lord, as we worship you, as your people gather and and are formed by your word. Lord, you've told us that that is your plan for your will to be done on the earth, is for your church to gather, to to be shaped, and to go out into the world under your mission. And so I just pray that that would be our hearts, God. May we see your kingdom come. May your will be done in all the earth because you are majestic and worthy of that praise and glory and honor. And so we open your word. We turn to your word. May your spirit be active among us this morning. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. So July 31st, 2022 is a very important day in history. Somewhere in the United States today, a woman is giving birth to George Jetson. Did you know this? This is the day that George Jetson was born. Today, 2022, how many of you watched the Jetsons or had kids that watched the Jetsons? So anybody know George's wife's name? Jane, his daughter's name? Judy, what was his son's name? Elroy, that's right. Next time you have trouble with your memory, you can say, at least I remember the important things in life. (laughs) Yeah, we were promised robot servants. I mean, that should be just around the corner then, right? If, if George is on his way. And flying cars, too. For those of you who don't know what the Jetsons was, it was a cartoon back in the 60s about the future. Now, we are walking through the book of First Kings this summer. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. And we are entering the part of the story where things start to get confusing. As you read First and Second Samuel... It's pretty straightforward because there's one kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. But in 1 Kings 12, which Craig preached a couple of weeks ago, God splits the kingdom. And now there is a northern kingdom called Israel, and there's a southern kingdom called Judah. And the rest of the book of 1 Kings is mostly about the stories from the northern kingdom, the kings and prophets from the north. And when the kingdom split... God chose a man named Jeroboam to be the first king of the northern kingdom. If you'll turn to 1 Kings 11, let me show you when that happened. So this is 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here, starting in verse 29. During that time, the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite met Jeroboam on the road as Jeroboam came out of Jerusalem. Now Ahijah had wrapped himself with a new cloak, and the two of them were alone in the open field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he had on, tore it into twelve pieces, and he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says, I am about to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I will give you ten tribes. Jump down to verse 37. I will appoint you... And you will reign as king over all you want, and you will be king over Israel. After that, if you obey all I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight in order to keep my statutes and my commands as my servant David did, I will be with you. I will build you a lasting dynasty, just as I built for David, and I will give you Israel. So God gave Jeroboam the northern kingdom, and he promised him a dynasty if he did what? If he obeyed God, if he followed God's instructions. So let's see how he did. Next chapter, chapter 12, 
Look at verse 26. Jeroboam said to himself, the kingdom might return to the house of David. If these people regularly go to offer sacrifices in the Lord's temple in Jerusalem, the heart of these people will, will return to their Lord, King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and go back to the king of Judah. So the king sought advice. Then he made two golden calves. And he said to the people, going to Jerusalem is too difficult for you. Israel, here are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set up one in Bethel and put the other in Dan. This led to sin. Jeroboam did not trust God with his new kingdom. He felt it depended on him to keep the loyalty of his subjects. So he comes up with this plan to keep his Israelite people from going south to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. He makes two golden calves. Now, does that sound familiar to you if you've read the Bible? Has anybody ever made a golden calf before? Who made the first golden calf? That's right. Moses' brother Aaron made it. And actually, Jeroboam uses the same words Aaron did. When Aaron made the golden calf, he said, Israel, here are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, if you've read that story, did that end well? No, that did not end well, and this isn't going to end well either. Jeroboam was, he was pr trying to provide a new way for the people to worship God, but he was breaking two of the Ten Commandments. Can anybody tell me what the second commandment is? What's the second commandment? Don't make any, any idols, any graven images, even of God. Don't make an image of Yahweh, the God of Israel, because you can't contain, you can't represent God in any man-made thing. And a man-made representation of God is actually another God. So he also broke the first commandment, which is have no other gods before me. It's, it's pretty sad. There's a missed opportunity here. God just handed Jeroboam a kingdom. All he had to do was follow God and obey him. And God promised great things to him. But Jeroboam chose his own way. And this sin, we're going to see this sin mentioned over and over and over through the rest of the book. Because this is the sin that led to the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam's sin. Now let's see how God responded to Jeroboam's actions. So turn to 1 Kings chapter 13. I'm going to invite Peyton to come read our scripture. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word and follow along as Peyton reads? Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. A man of God came. However, from Judah to Bethel, by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing beside the altar to burn incense. The man of God cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, Altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son will be born to the house of David, named Josiah, and he will sacrifice on you, the priest of the high places who are burning incense on you. Human burns will be burned on you. He gave a sign that day. He said, this is the sign that the Lord has spoken. The altar will now be ripped apart, and the ashes that are on it will be poured out. When the king heard the message that the man of God had cried out against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar and said, arrest him. But the hand he stretched out against him withered, and he could not pull it back to himself. The altar was ripped apart, and the ashes poured from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given him by the word of the Lord. Then the king responded to the man of God, plead for the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me so that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God pleaded for favor of the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it had been at first. Then the king declared to the man of God, come home with me, refresh yourself and I'll give you a reward. But the man of God replied, if you were to give me half your house, I still wouldn't go with you, and I wouldn't eat food or drink water in this place, for this is what I was commanded by the word of the Lord. 
you must not eat food or drink water or go back the way you came. So he went another way. He did not go back by the way he had came to Bethel. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, I pray for myself and I pray for my friends in this room that as we hear your word today, that we would obey it. I ask that you would remind us through this story of the incomparable value of your word for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Chapter 13 is a two-part story. You just heard the first part. So let's look at the first part about Jeroboam and this encounter with this man of God, and then we'll read the second part of the story. Right off the bat, verse 1, we're introduced to a person called the man of God, and that's all we know about him. We don't know where he's from. We don't know his occupation. We don't know who his family was. We don't know what flavor ice cream he likes. We don't know anything about this guy because the important thing isn't who he was, but what he brought. And what he brought was the word of the Lord. Now, let me chase a quick rabbit. Look at verse 1. Do you see how the word Lord in verse 1 is written in all capital letters? All lower, they're all capital letters, but they're small caps. Have you ever noticed that in your Bibles, why in the Old Testament, the word Lord a lot of times is all small caps? And in the New Testament, go over the New Testament, there's no small caps anymore. You know why that is? Well, it's English Bible translators trying to help us know when God's name is used. God told his name, his personal name, his covenant name to Moses, the name Yahweh. So anytime in the Old Testament, when it says Yahweh, you get Lord, all caps, so that we as English readers know every time God's name is used in the Old Testament. Now back to our story. So this man of God brings a word from Yahweh to King Jeroboam. He says human bones will be burned on this altar by a future king of Judah, but this doesn't take place for nearly 200 years. But God gives immediate proof that this is a valid prophecy, and the altar is ripped. And how does Jeroboam respond in verse 4? Well, he tries to arrest the man of God. And his arm immediately withers and stiffens up. Sort of like a tiny T-Rex arm probably is what happened to him. Now, have you ever thought, if only God would speak to me directly. If only God would give me a clear and direct sign, then I would do everything he asked me to. Have you ever thought that? How clear of a message did Jeroboam get from God? He got God's direct word from a man of God for him. He got a sign from God, his arm withering and the altar being ripped apart right in front of him. But those things were not enough to redirect his heart. God even showed him mercy by restoring his arm. That still wasn't enough. But Jeroboam wasn't dissuaded from his plans because he had, de- he had decided that the biggest threat to his rule was the, the loyalty of his people. So that's why he built. He built a substitute temple. He built a substitute altar to worship a substitute God. Now, while he rightly recognized that loyalty was the biggest problem, it wasn't his people's loyalty that was the problem. It was his own loyalty. He was not loyal to Yahweh, who made him king over Israel. And the last thing we see in verse 8 and 9 of this first part is that Yahweh gave the man of God another word, another word that he shouldn't receive any hospitality, no eating, no drinking on this trip, go home a different way. And being faithful, the man of God rejects Jeroboam's offer and leaves. Now, let's look at the second part of the story. I'm going to read the second part of the story, and it is weird, okay? It is weird. See if you can picture it in your mind as I read. I'm going to start in 1 Kings 13, verse 11. Now a certain prophet was living in Bethel. His sons came and told him all the deeds that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. His sons also told their father the words that he had spoken to the king. Then their father asked them, which way did he go? His sons had seen the way taken by the man of God who had come from Judah. 
Then he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he got on it. He followed the man of God and found him sitting under an oak tree. He asked him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he said. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat some food. But he answered, I cannot go back with you or accompany you. I will not eat food or drink water with you in this place. For a message came to me by the word of the Lord. You must not eat food or drink water there or go back by the way you came. He said to him, I am also a prophet like you. An angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. Bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat food and drink water. The old prophet deceived him. And the man of God went back with him, ate food in his house and drank water. While they were still sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And the prophet cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. Because you rebelled against the Lord's command and did not keep the command that the Lord your God commanded you. But you went back and ate food and drank water in the place that he said to you, do not eat food and do not drink water. Your corpse will never reach the grave of your ancestors. So after he had eaten food and after he had drunk, the old prophet saddled the donkey for the prophet he had brought back. When he left, a lion attacked him along the way and killed him. His corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey was standing beside it. The lion was standing beside the corpse too. There were men passing by who saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing beside it. And they went and spoke about it in the city where the old prophet lived. When the prophet who had brought him back from his way heard about it, he said, He is the man of God who disobeyed the Lord's command. The Lord has given him to the lion. It has mauled and killed him according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to him. Then the old prophet instructed his son, saddle the donkey for me. They saddled it. And he went and found the corpse thrown on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse or mauled the donkey. So the prophet lifted the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back. The old prophet came into the city to mourn and to bury him. Now what in the world is that about? After reading a story like that, don't you have questions? I have lots of questions. Like, why did this prophet lie to the man of God? And then once he lied, why did God send his true word through the guy who just lied? And why was the punishment so severe? But the author doesn't answer any of those questions. He's not interested in answering the questions. And frankly, our questions distract us from the main point of this passage. What is the main point of this passage? Before we get to the main point, let me draw your attention to a couple of details, and then I'll share the main point. First detail I want you to see. Have you ever heard a person claim, the Lord spoke to me? Has anybody ever told you, God told me something to tell you? Has that ever happened to you? Or maybe have you ever felt like God told you something that somebody else needed to hear? Here's a truth you need to know. Anytime someone claims to have a message from God, you need to compare what they say to the Bible. Anytime someone claims to have a message from God, you need to compare what they say to God's actual word. It doesn't matter how trustworthy that person is. It doesn't matter if it's your parent. It doesn't matter if it's your grow group leader. It doesn't matter if it's your pastor. You need to compare those claims to the Bible. This old prophet claimed that an angel brought him a message. But angels don't change God's word. They don't change God's message. Do you know about Galatians 1.8? You don't have to turn there now. You can look at it later. Galatians 1.8, the apostle Paul says, even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches a different gospel, a curse be on him. Meaning that if an angel shows up this morning and contradicts what God has written to us, we should denounce him and kick him out of here. This is why it is so important that you know what God's word says. You must know what God's word says so that you can compare it to all the other words that you're going to hear. There are many voices in our world today saying many different things 
Many of them say that we can't trust this book. They say that we can't trust what this book says about the roles of men and women in the home or in the church. People that say that we can't trust what this book says that sex only belongs in a marriage covenant between a man and a woman. People that say that we can't trust the rules in this book, that they're archaic and confining and we should be free to do what makes us happy. There are many voices in our world today with messages that sound reasonable, sometimes with messages that sound compassionate. But if their message doesn't line up with God's word, we reject it. We reject it. The message is wrong. From the passage, I also want you to know, I want you to note that the man of God passed the first test and he failed the second one. When Jeroboam, the king, offered him a reward, he rejected that and that hospitality, but he was deceived by the old prophet. Here's the second truth. Just because you laced, just because you aced your last spiritual test doesn't mean you will ace the next one. Just because you successfully passed a previous spiritual test or trial or temptation does not guarantee that you're going to pass the next one. The New Testament is filled with commands to us to be vigilant, to be prepared, to be on our guard. This was a man of God who disobeyed God's command. Just because you belong to God, that doesn't make you exempt from disobeying God. And for those of us in this room, temptation comes at each of us in different ways at different times. For some of us, it might be lust might be the temptation that's in front of us right now. For others, it might be a critical attitude. For others, it could be laziness. For someone else, it might be bitterness and unforgiveness. For somebody else, it might be greed. It might be jealousy. As God's people, we need to figure out the devil's schemes that are most effective against us. He has different schemes for all of us, and some of them are more effective against us than others. We need to know which ones are effective against us so that we can be prepared to fight them, to stand against them. This man of God wasn't prepared the second time. And God sent a lion to kill him. Now, the last detail about this episode I want to point out is the lion's behavior. You see what the lion did? It killed the guy, threw his corpse on the road, and then just sat there by the corpse and the donkey and didn't do anything else. That is not normal lion behavior. That shows us that this was God's judgment. This wasn't just a random act. And so much so that the old prophet, when he gets there, he recognizes this is God's hand at work. And he just walks right up next to the lion and picks up the corpse and, and goes on. Now, with those details about the story behind us, what is the point of this story? Why is it included in the Bible? What are we supposed to learn from a story like this? Well, it all has to do with the hidden actor. Did you notice, as we just read through the whole chapter, did you notice the hidden actor in chapter 13? On first hearing, you might think there are three main actors. We had King Jer Jeroboam, we had the man of God, and we had the old prophet. But there's a fourth actor that's doing stuff all throughout the chapter. It's the word of God. The word of God. Look at verse 1. A man of God came by the word of the Lord to Bethel. What about verse 2? The man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. Look at verse 5. The altar was ripped apart by the word of the Lord. Look at verse 26. With the lion, the lion mauled and killed him by the word of the Lord. The main point of this story is that God's word is alive and powerful. That's the main point of this story. God's word is alive and powerful. That means that the Bible sitting on your laps right now is not passive like any other book you've held this week. It's alive. It's powerful. There's a place in Isaiah that tells us that God sends his word out to do stuff. And when God sends it out, his word actually goes and does the stuff and then comes back to him. 
There's a place in Hebrews 4 that tells us that God's word is living and active, that it judges our hearts and it judges our thoughts. Now, this shouldn't surprise us to hear that God's word is alive and active because God's word is not just a book. The word of God is not just a book. Turn to John, the gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, 1 tells us that God's word, this Bible that you're holding, is not just a book. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He, God's word, calls it a he. He was with God in the beginning because the word of God is a person. The word of God is a person. It's Jesus. And in some way that we don't quite understand and we can't wrap our minds around, Jesus is alive and and active through this book. That is why to reject the word of God is the greatest of sins. Because that means you have rejected Jesus, who is the only way to salvation. This book, from start to finish, tells us who Jesus is and what we must do to be saved. And in both parts of our story in 1 Kings 13, a person valued something more than God's word. Jeroboam valued the allegiance of his subjects more than God's word. The man of God valued the word of this prophet more than God's word. And in both cases, destruction was the result. Destruction is always the result of ignoring God's word. Church family, the determining factor for your life will be what you do with God's word. That's the only factor that matters. The only one that will determine where you end up and how you end up is what you do with God's word. Now, I know that for many in this room, reading God's word daily is a challenge. I know that's hard to do. I know that probably for most of you, it's a habit you'd like to develop, but you've just found it to be very difficult. That Maybe there are days that you come to the Bible to read and it just seems like a chore. I just feel like I'm not getting anything out of this right now. I want you to know that I have those days too. I have days just like that where I don't want to read God's word and I can't seem to find anything valuable in God's word. Days when it seems dry and pointless. And do you know what I do on those days? I think about John chapter 6, verse 68. Jesus was teaching the crowds and it was hard stuff. It was things that they didn't understand and it was, they were hearing truth that they didn't like. And the crowd started leaving Jesus. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, are y'all going to leave too? And Peter, in a moment of clarity, said, where else would we go? You have the words of life. Where else would we go? You have the words of life. Those are the words that I think on when I come to the Bible and I feel like nothing's there and I don't want to read it. I say, where else am I going to go today? Nowhere else I go today am I going to find words of life. These are words of life whether I feel connected to them or not. They just are. I need them today. You need them today. The determining factor in your life will be what you do with God's word. Are you trusting it? Are you building your life on it? Or are you ignoring it? Are you finding other messages more convincing? There was a time in Jesus' life on earth when Satan offered him alternatives. Satan offered Jesus alternatives to what God said in his word. He offered Jesus alternative provisions. He said, Turn these stones to bread. He offered him an alternative interpretation of scripture. He said, you can test God. Jump off and God will rescue you. Satan offered him an alternative, alternative path to glory. 
He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of earth, all the glory in earth, if you'll just bow and worship me. I want you to know that Satan still offers these same alternatives to us as God's people. He offers us alternative provisions. He says he tricks us so that we believe that we're responsible to provide for ourselves, that we don't need God. We just will work hard and then we'll enjoy the fruits of our labor. It's all us. God's not providing for you. Satan offers us alternative interpretations of Scripture. He tells us, you can't really trust everything that's in this book. God didn't really mean everything that he wrote in the Bible. You can ignore the parts that are out of date that don't make sense to modern people anymore. He's offering us alternative interpretations to Scripture. He also offers us an alternative path to the glory and fulfillment that we hope for. He says there's a shortcut. You don't have to do things God's way. Don't fall for his lies. Learn what God says in his word and then build your life on it. Eternal life is only found in listening to and trusting Jesus and his words. Do you remember how Jesus responded to Satan's temptations? He said, man doesn't live by bread alone. Man lives by what God says, every word from the mouth of God. So let me ask you this morning, are there any parts of God's word that you've been ignoring? Are there any parts of God's word, things that you know he's asked of you and you haven't agreed to obey him? You've been unwilling to submit. Today is the day to repent and to submit to Jesus and his word. We're going to sing a song here in a moment. I'll be standing down front. If there's something that comes to your mind where you haven't been submitting to God's word and you want somebody to talk to about it, I would be glad to talk with you about that. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word today from 1 Kings. We thank you for the example that we have from two people who didn't listen to your word and we see the destruction that came into their lives. We do not want to be like them. That is a warning to us. We want to be people who see the value of your word and use it daily and get to know you better daily because you have the words of life. We're not going to find them anywhere else. So I pray for myself and everyone else in this room that we would begin to value your words more than the bread that we eat each day. Do that work in our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy. Holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to 
those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. That's the perfect line to, to leave on. Uh, if you've been a part of our church family for long, you've you heard Roger say it already, and you've heard us say before, that we exist as a church to know God, to grow together, and to bless the world. And so as we leave uh, today to finish with these words on our list, to lead me in your love to those around me, that is what he's called us to do. And so as we do that, I want to ask our um, prayer partners to come forward. And after we dismiss, if you uh, have something you'd like to pray about, if you have been led to repentance and you wished you would have come and talked to Pastor Clint during that song, you can come talk to a prayer partner now. Or if you have another need or something, they, they're here to pray with you as we dismiss. And so uh, let these words lead us in, into the world to bless the world from 1 Peter 5.10. May the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ himself, restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. We'll see you tonight.